would please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, as always, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, because it is His blood that washes us clean. Father, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here today to hear about this very dangerous and important subject. We appreciate you giving Julie a safe trip over from Greenville so that she can speak to us. We hope that we will pay attention carefully and allow ourselves to be educated on a topic that many of us until now have been completely ignorant of because there are lives at stake, even in this very community, Father. So we, we pray that you would guide the thoughts, the words, and the actions that are taken because of this, so that you, not only would you be glorified, but children and their families would be protected. We thank you for this club and for the fellowship and the effect that we can have in this community because of our membership in this club. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all of the blessings that you've poured out upon us. And we ask you, Father, to bless us as we seek to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. In Jesus' name, amen. We do have an important speaker today. She will be available to hang around for a few minutes uh, once her presentation is over because she knows y'all have got to get back to work. But if any of you want to stay and speak with her, She's going to be available, and we'll keep the room open for that. But uh, I was called, oh, I don't know, a month, six weeks ago to a meeting in Greenville for this same purpose, and it was put on by the Rotary Club over there. And I went because of the position I hold, my job, and I was blown away. I've lived in this part of the state. I've lived in Sulphur Springs for 55 years. I had no idea how big this problem is and that it had reached its pinnacles right into our own communities. Our children and grandchildren are at risk. And that's why I immediately at the end of that meeting went to Julie and said, would you please consider coming to Sulphur Springs to talk about this to our group? And she said yes instantly. So I want to present to you Julie Prettyman from Greenville. She has a very lovely compadre in crime. Uh, Hillary Evans, who is local, she's from Sulphur Springs. Uh, she's here for kind of moral support, just to express uh, her support for the whole thing. So, Julie, I'm going to let you tell them whatever it is you feel is appropriate, okay. and I will sit down and hush. Okay, awesome. I'm glad you guys came today and gave up your lunch hour. I'm kind of important topic and you guys have your bellies filled and so hopefully you don't fall asleep but um, this this topic is really important and near and dear to my heart for various reasons um, and I'll and I'll kind of explain some of that in a bit but um, my name is Julie Pretty Man and um, I my husband and I um, serve in Greenville my husband's actually a pastor and I give you a little bit of background I was a stay-at-home mom homeschool our kids we have six kids and so to be honest I have been very ignorant of the world and the underbelly of the world and I got thrusted into it for various reasons. Um, we um, adopted um, some teenage kids from Ukraine I, eight years ago, a boy and a girl, and a missionary was at our church and explained to us um, that these kids when they age out of the orphanages they end up on the street and a lot of the boys end up in jail or prison because of crime and the girls end up in prostitution. And so we had teenagers um, ourselves. We had three biological kids at the time. And um, we just felt like um, the, the Lord was pulling on our heartstrings to adopt kids from Ukraine. So we did adopt a boy and a girl. And um, 10 months later, we were asked to come back from one of the um, girls, um, one of our daughters that we adopted there, her roommate in the orphanage asked if we would come adopt her. And, um, I was not, like I said, I was just a stay-at-home mom. And something kind of tipped me off that didn't seem right when she asked us to come adopt her because she was supposed to be adopted by a family in the United States when we had met her there. And so um, when I had talked to that family and asked why it had fallen through, there were some flags that kind of started going up for me that didn't just sit well, and so I started taking notes. Um, 
And long story short, they, they are, there's an FBI investigation going on with this family. Their intent was to um, traffic her and, along with other orphans from, from that same orphanage. And so it's still ongoing because of all the evidence that they have to gather with the forensic um, interviews with all the girls involved. So that, we, we, did, we did go back 10 months later and got a 16-year-old girl and adopted her. And that was really our first introduction to human trafficking. Um, she was going to be trafficked on two other fronts as well in Ukraine. And um, one was a Russian mail order bride um, situation. And in Ukraine, it's perfectly legal to sell them at 18. And so they are told, you know, if a Westerner can buy you, purchase you, you'll have a better life. And sometimes that is true, and sometimes it's not. And yet they don't have kid, um, a parent advocating for them. And so um, th those, that was one of the, the fronts of which trafficking um, was involved as well. So fast forward, that was, that was eight years ago. Then, then a year, 10 months later, we adopted another girl. And then four years ago, um, my niece was trafficked here in the States. And uh, my twin, it's my identical twin sister, she called me and said, um, Faith is gone. And it was just like a tsunami hit them. And she wasn't rebellious. She didn't have a boyfriend. There was no reason for her to just abruptly leave from their perspective. And she did. And so um, that being said, my sister had kind of shared a few things. and. I right away said this is human trafficking. And no one believed me, the parents didn't believe me, my, my husband didn't believe me, they thought, Julie, you're crazy, this is not trafficking. But again, we had six children, teenage kids, and she left her phone behind and she left her car behind to seek independence. And I'm like, I've got six kids and there's not a one of them that would have left their phone and car behind for, for independence, right? So I knew something was off there and two days later we found her um, I did a lot of investigation, got the FBI involved there too because they um, crossed state lines. When they had called the local authorities, they couldn't do anything because she was 17 and they saw her as an adult making this choice to leave because she left a letter behind. So when I knew that they crossed state lines, I'm like, we can get the FBI involved. So we did that and we were able to find her, um, it was two days later, in San Diego. There was three military personnel involved in the recruitment of her um, with the Air Force, Army, and Navy. So uh, the recruiter was from the Air Force, the Romeo Pimp was from the Army, and then there was another person involved with the recruitment and he was from the Navy and they were headed to San, um, San Diego, is that right, for where the Navy is. So that being said, that's how I got thrusted into this ministry and, and I've been really um, have a heart and passion to educate people on the signs of trafficking. And I was talking to Jim about this earlier because um, just recently, I like word pictures, and uh, recently a word picture kind of came to my mind. And I'm sure, I think there's some doctors in the midst, but like if you think about a heart attack, most of us know the signs of a heart attack, right? You know, heaviness of chest, tingling, that's, there's different signs that are precursors to a heart attack happening. And that being said, if we ignore those signs, we could, it could be fatal, right? And same with trafficking. Ignoring the signs of trafficking can be fatal to these individuals as well. The average um, victim lives seven years after they're recruited into the life for various reasons. And so um, I'm here to educate, and this is just going to be a broad overview. I'd love to do talk for hours on this subject, and I could um, if, if I was given the time. But this is just only 30 minutes, and if you'd like more information about the topic, there's classes um, on your brochure through Poema Foundation, and that's one of the organizations I volunteer out of. They have um, online classes that are through Zoom. And they also do in-person classes at Lake Point out of Rockwall and, and various actually DFW area churches that do the classes. So those are available if you'd like to learn more about this. So this is going to be a really broad overview. And um, I'd like to just mainly um, highlight the, the signs of what we're looking for because they can be easily mistaken. So we're going to go over the signs of trafficking, what sex trafficking is, 
and um, the problem like why um, they don't self-identify because that's huge as well as why we as citizens sometimes don't identify um, the problem and then I'm going to go over some ways we can get involved on a local level. Um, before I start a little bit I do, vol um, I do advocate for Shared Hope International and it's an international anti-trafficking ministry that um, helps with legislation on, on the um, political level. And so they educate us with the laws and our states and such. And so I've done um, some research and help on the legislative level with the um, Human Trafficking Task Force out of Austin. And then I also volunteer now with Poema, which is a local, um, local ministry out of Rockwall, and that's what your brochures and pamphlets are. And um, then I'm a Greenville Outreach Coordinator, which is just one of their branches that we um, reach out and pass out posters of missing children in our area. Um, we have over 100 routes that we do. And one of them, um, we have four routes in Greenville that we do, and we campus local area truck stops, restaurants, and um, hotels where we suspect trafficking <coughs> happening. And we do training for that because we are looking for specific things, and that's another meeting that you can be a part of to join the outreach ministry efforts. We'd love to have it come all the way out to Sulphur Springs, and that was another um, area of which we could create some routes here as well. Um, in fact, this Saturday we have, we have an outreach um, that will be from 10 to 12, and one of the um, kids that are the youth that is on our posters is actually from Greenville. So this is another thing that I'm here to um, just educate us to know that this is happening right in our backyards. It's everywhere. It's not just internationally like I once thought. So what is um, sex trafficking? Um, by definition, as far as the federal government goes, sex trafficking is anything that has exchanged for commercial sex. It could be, um, it doesn't have to be money. It could be rent. It could be um, any goods that are exchanged. And it is through force, fraud, or coercion. And with a minor, force, fraud, or coercion does not have to be proven. But with an adult, one of those three things has to be proven in order to prove that it's sex trafficking. The three top venues, this was kind of interesting to me, a lot of times we have these stereotypes of what trafficking looks like because of Hollywood productions. And um, unfortunately, they give us this, um, we think it happens internationally a lot of times. We think it happens maybe with games. Um, we think it happens, over, uh, like I said, overseas and brothels and such. But I want to choo, 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 erase all that from your mind because, yes, it does happen internationally. Yes, it does happen in brothels, and yes, gangs are involved. But it also happens right here from your average-looking person. Um, with my niece, the guy, if we saw him at Walmart, you would think he was 23 years old. Like I said, he was in the military. You wouldn't bat your eye at looking at him. He's a nice-looking kid. And um, the, the recruiter was a you know, average looking girl. Again, not somebody you would take a double look and think they look like a trafficker. You know, we kind of get these images in our mind of what they look like. And so um, it, can, it can happen to anyone. Um, it's, it does not, um, it's not to a certain race, a socioeconomic background. All teenagers are vulnerable. And that's really important to understand. And the reason they're vulnerable is because they're easy to manipulate. And one thing that I've learned even through adoption, uh, I've read a lot of books on trauma and how trauma affects the brain and it really affects the frontal cortex of the brain, which is the reasoning side of the brain. And so a lot of these traffickers will spend sometimes even years grooming the girls and creating um, trauma to them, whether it be a date rape or a gang rape or those kinds of traumatic events in order to control their victim. And I liken it like an invisible um, gun to their head and how they control. So. Now I can't even scroll my screen. No, it's so That's not cool. Hmm, this is a brand new computer too. Um, so quick facts as far as trafficking, this, um, the, the statistics are very unreliable because a lot of trafficking is unreported. Um, we have hundreds of thousands in the United States. In fact, the United States is the number one um, 
a buyer for, um, for sexual trafficking. And yet again, we think a lot of times it's an overseas issue and, and yet it's right here. Um, so I'm really sad I can't go through my notes here. Reasons why there's a lot of misidentification of victims. This is, this is really important. So um, as, as citizens, maybe your, your field is a teacher or a coach or you work with um, young children or, or teens. And these signs are really important because if we, even like law enforcement or medical personnel, it can be right under our nose. And if we don't understand the signs um, and see them and, and label them as victims, then the, the proper action might not be um, taken for their safety. And so understanding these signs is really important when we're working with youth. And they, they can be um, misunderstood. And so if professionals are misidentifying them as victims and maybe even labeling them as prostitutes, and statistically speaking, 95% of prostitutes are being forced to sell themselves, if we know that to be true, we can assume that if somebody is promiscuous and selling themselves, then most likely trafficking is involved. Um, so as, as professionals in the medical field and such, if we mislabel them, then you know, they're not gonna see themselves as a victim as well. And again, I go back to Hollywood. I think Hollywood has really um, caused our, our thinking of what we think it looks like, and then we, we easily mislabel them. Um, with my niece, you know, there was almost a year of grooming the first time she was recruited, and her friend, it was a girlfriend, that came over and um, spent a lot of time with her. And the grooming process is very interesting during that process. This is really important to understand, that they're gathering information from who they want this victim, who, who, who they want as their victim. And as they're gathering information, they're going to either sell that information or use that information for, for various reasons. Um, so because I don't have my notes, I'm just going to go off and ad lib here with my niece. Um, that my niece wanted a, a, a country boy, you know. Uh, she loved line dancing. She, um, she went to church every week. Um, she loved ch Japanese food. And so this whole year, this girl was, her friend was gathering all this information. And then a year later, the Romeo pimp shows up. And he drives a blue pickup, which is her favorite color blue. He takes her to a Japanese restaurant, which is her favorite restaurant. He has a big belt buckle on, takes her line dancing, and wears a cross neck basong. He took her to church every week. This is really important too. These people can be sitting in our pews at church, the trafficker as well as the victim. <clears throat> Huh? What's Romeo pimp? That is a Romeo pimp. That's exactly right. So the five types of, uh, thank you, five types of trafficking, that's one of the things, again, going back to what we have as stereotypes, is a lot of times gang affiliation, and that is one of the ways they do traffic victims. But the number one way of trafficking a victim is through a Romeo pimp, a boyfriend. And so all that time that they are using to gather the information of the victim, they place these recruiters in schools, in churches, in um, anywhere there's youth, it may even be on a sporting team, like a basketball team or whatever, to recruit um, recruit these girls. And they're just gathering information and pretending to be their friend. Um, with my niece, you know, she really just thought this friend had all the same interest. When she wanted to go ride horses, this girl went and rode horses with her. She had no interest in horses, but she was using, using it to um, gain information. And so the Romeo pimp, is really the number one way of recruiting. And that is why we sometimes mislabel trafficking because we don't see it even when it happens right under our nose. And one of the things, tactics they use is to create a wedge between the family. If they can create a wedge with the family, then they become their family, their new family. And um, that, those are, again, signs that we can see happening in, within a home uh, family. Faith was really, um, close with her family, but this, this recruiter kept staging events um, so that the parents would continually say no to her. For instance, can, can she go to St. Louis with me? They're from Kansas City, St. Louis, that's four hours apart. The parents said, no way, you know, that's a long way. Well, your parents are controlling. 
And so there, this is the kind of stuff that was happening over and over to create a scenario narrative that the parents were controlling. And yet the parents weren't controlling, they were protective, but not controlling. And then the one time the parents allowed her to go to the recruiter's house, which they did not know was the recruiter, was the, the time that when she went missing. And so um, that's, that is the number one way of trafficking how it happens in the United States. There's also familial trafficking. And this is um, from what Hillary just informed me is one of the number one ways here in East Texas that it happens. Again, I thought familial trafficking way back before my research and study was always in third world countries where they would maybe sell their kids to provide for their family out of desperation. Horrible, I'm not condoning it, it's just sometimes the desperation led to desperate um, choices. And so yet this is the number way, one way of trafficking here in East Texas is through familial trafficking. And a lot of times that type of trafficking isn't really about the money so much. Um, money is you know, greatly involved in trafficking, but it's really about the next hit. Um, some of them are drug druggies and they want their next hit and in order to get their next hit, they sell their child in order to provide for their drug habit. And so that's, that's a really big um, way of trafficking here in Texas, uh, specifically East Texas. So again, if you're working with youth and you see something going on. It could have, it could be um, um, hard to identify because the family's selling them and so they're living from their home and, um, and going to school and such. I still keep wanting to slide down. So um, the, other, the other ones are the guerrilla traffickers and that's the street name for a, a gang member that uses force or violence to control their victims. That's the third type of trafficking. That is the most rare form of trafficking that there is. And you know, when I educate kids on this, when I do um, education on the school level, one of the things that we need to let them know is that 95% of the time, the threats that they use are empty threats. And um, I help with like some of these investigations when families call me looking for their children. And I know that to be true in teaching that 95% of the time the threats are empty, but I've actually had somebody, a perpetrator, contact me through the victim's phone and I was shaking from head to toe. And I was in the safety of my own home with my husband and yet it was very scary to have a threat like that. And so now going through that, it really made me empathize with these kids when they're being threatened with their life or their family member, I'll shoot your brother or your mother. And even though they're empty threats, these kids most of the time don't know that. And so there, it's an easy way for the perpetrators to control their victims through these threats. They don't even have to use a bullet. They just have to say they're going to. And it's enough to control them. And that's one of the reasons why it's really helpful to understand because I didn't understand from my perspective, even like, being in church ministry, we've dealt with even domestic violence with women, why they go back. It never really under, it made sense to me from an outsider. And like, why would you go back and put yourself in that position? But because of fear and the tactics and manipulation that they use, it's so strong that they are scared to leave, scared for their life. And so that's a lot of the reason they go back and, and um, they don't, they don't see a way out. And so one of the things that I do with advocating for families when they call me, um, I help search for their loved one. A lot of times law enforcement can't get involved because of their age. If they're 17 and older, your guys' hands are tied as you write. And so they can't help because they see them as adults making this decision. And so out of desperation, the families will call and say, we don't know what to do. We suspect something nefarious is happening. Could you help us? And so that's when a lot of times I'll get involved. It doesn't take long. Usually within 10 minutes, I can comb through their social media, um, look at some things, and there's a lot of codes that they use. And it's pretty easy to kind of comb through social media and figure out what's going on um, and if it is indeed trafficking. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> So um, that's one of the things that I do help with the families trying to help locate their loved ones. Um, there's usually a trail and it's pretty easy to find out where they are. 
The hard thing is once we find where they are getting them out. Because again, if they don't self-identify, they don't see themselves as a victim, you can offer them a way out and it's, it's very difficult. So one thing I wanted to share, which is to me fascinating is on one side it's horrible, on the other side it's fascinating, is 1% is ever rescued from trafficking. So it's really, really low. And I think a lot of it is because they don't self-identify and we as citizens don't know how to self or identify the, the victims as well. But with the outreach efforts of POEMA that we do that I was telling you about with passing out flyers of missing minors in our area, 70 to 80 percent of the minors are found in our local area and are rescued from trafficking. And so the statistics of what we're doing in our efforts is very high. And so that is one way you can get involved on a local level. And like I said, we're, we campus the areas, we're looking for trafficking activity, we report it to a private investigator that works for our team, and then he sets up shop, and if he sees that the, there is in, indeed trafficking happening, he'll report it to local law enforcement and then they can make arrests from there. And so that's one of the avenues of which you can get involved locally. The other thing is just being aware of the signs. I've passed out flyers and there's signs on the red pamphlet, um, and they're on the back here. And so just kind of going over that, because of time, I don't have a lot of time to go over it, but again, a lot of these signs are evident. And so when one or two of these signs happen, we can kind of discount it that, okay, the kid got a tattoo, no big deal. Okay, he drinks alcohol, a lot of teenagers drink alcohol. So we're not gonna say that's trafficking, but when we have five, 10 signs, and a lot of times when the family's calling me, there's five or 10 of these signs stacked up, then we've kind of got to consider, you know, what's going on here. And um, it's, again, going back to that heart attack, you know, you've got heaviness of chest, chest pains, tingling, we know a heart attack's gonna happen. Same with trafficking, there's signs here. And so if we recognize the signs, we can help report it or, you know, um, just get, getting involved in asking questions to that youth. Maybe it's, are you safe at home? Do you feel safe? And if they say yes or no, you know, taking it to the next um, next level as far as questions. And so that's one way we can get get involved too on a local level within our church. We might see some of these signs where kids have bruises on their faces and such. Um, I did want to just just on a little level, it was kind of interesting. This was a girl that was trafficked in Greenville, and the family member contacted me. And this is this is another sign. Um, she used her grandma's phone, and on the text it said, do you want work or green? And a flag went up to the grandma. She knew that it didn't make sense, and the grandma suspected trafficking, and so she contacted me and asked if I would decode the sentence. And so I'm telling you this because if you see stuff on kids' social media, if you read something on a text, whether it be a family member or whatever, and the sentence doesn't make sense, then you need to have somebody decode it and figure out what the sentence means. In this case, the sentence meant, do you want work, meaning sex, or do you want green, meaning marijuana? And then the sentence made sense. And I had to step back and think, okay, well, that was easy to decode, but it's subjective, right? So if we were to take that to the police and say, she asked on a text, do you want sex or marijuana? She can totally deny it and say, that's not what I meant, right? But if you ask, do you want sex or marijuana, you can't really deny that. That's pretty, pretty blanket, you know, that it's there, out there. So they use codes to speak and um, on social media. They use emojis to communicate the value of or the cost of the girl. They use SpongeBob. It's a um, cartoon. Car uh, SpongeBob is also what, one of the ways that they're using codes. And so when I see SpongeBob over and over, and I've seen that on even gang members' um, pages, like with the MS-13 gang, it's all really dark, 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 bloody kind of gang stuff, and then SpongeBob. It just stands out, you know, so you start seeing patterns with these things and looking and it helps me to look into it further, like what's going on here. Excuse, so, excuse mm -hmm. me. Yeah. We're really out of time. Okay, so that that's it. And um, those are, that's an overview. If you want more, go to um, Poema um, website and you can get um, further education on this. So. That's Poema. You probably got it on your table. Thank you, thank you. And I did leave business cards if you ever, hopefully never need to call me, <laughs> but if you do, I'd be glad to help, and those are on the center of your table as well.
Thank you. I promised them that you would hang around for a few sure. minutes in yeah, case somebody wants to speak sure. to you one on one or whatever. Sure. So thank you for being here. We're thrilled to have our guests, James and Judy, and the ones I can't remember the names <laughs> of. And, and uh, everybody so thank you very much uh, I felt like this was important I hope now that you've heard it you understand why I thought it was important so thank you for having me be blessed go in peace <laughs> keep your nose clean your chin up and your powder dry ring your bell ring your bell, yeah, ring your bell. Ring your bell. Ring your bell. Ring your bell.